Hello brothers and sisters. I'll be doing fine for you today. This is a presentation of stories. My delusional to think that um palm clad people will change or will act like there is no something like, you know, um like a caste system that they think that they are much of higher value as compared to black people. Am I delusional? to think that there will be a world where there is nothing like color, where there is nothing like systemic racism. Am I delusional to think that it's okay to um to think that black people, not black people but white people will change their, you know, racist behavior and just not see other people as subhuman and see people as their equals or their friends? I think when you ask me that, according to Minister Louis Farrakhan, he will say that I'm delusional because this is what he says. And he says that white people can never change and they have never changed throughout the history. Um, there are modern things that keeps on happening that happened during the Jim Crow times. And I think he explained it, um, he explained it in an in-depth way, which makes us want to understand everything which is happening when it comes to uh, this context of just trying to, you know, um, getting to know the truth. So um, Mr. Louis Farrakhan is saying that palm colored folks will never change. And they have never changed. I want you to hear his reasons on probably I know most of um, black people are resonating with whatever he's saying. And as a person who, as a continental African, I think I agree with him because these are people who have lived life, lived this life. I've seen these atrocities done to their ancestors, to their sisters, to their brothers, to their babies who are, who are going in school. So, um, these are people who have fully lived these experiences. And as I do, I don't just take people's opinion for granted. And I don't have to go to the United States to agree that these things are happening because it's true. It is happening. Tell me what you think about this in the video. Um, I want to let you watch this video by Minister Louis Farrakhan, uh, who is going to say this. And I want us to just learn from him and hear what he have to say in regards to this. Um, these are presented in stories. And if you're watching this video for the first time, I'll ask you to subscribe to the channel. If you wish, you could check my Patreon account and support me. I'll really, really, really be appreciative of it. Until then, let's dive right into the video. You're not going to even discuss it at me. See, but that's a slap in the face to those who have hope in the slave master. No, 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 listen, listen to me. See, you think he's different. You think that the children of the former slave master are different than the former slave master. And that's your problem. You refuse to accept the reality that the children are the same as their fathers. Just wiser now. Many of us grow up in integrated circumstances. And we have little white friends. No, that's... No, no, I'm not being racist. I'm just... I'm just making a statement of fact. We have white friends when we're growing up. If you grow up in some integrated uh, environment, on the track team, on the basketball team, on the football team, white friends. In music school. Uh, you know. But the young boy that was your friend in grade school and high school, the difference becomes when he grows up, power is open to him, but not to you. So now you got a degree, he got one, but you got to go downtown to where your friend that you went to school has his office because his daddy is a big man. 
and he was wearing, trying to wear dreads and all that kind of stuff, smoking reefer with you, snorting a little cocaine with you. And you say, that's my man. See, but they're like snakes that haven't grown venom yet. You know, you, you understand uh, pre-adolescence? You got a sperm, but it ain't working. You got an egg, but it can't produce. But when puberty comes, hair begin to grow up under the arms in other places. Trouble times. Because now what was dormant yesterday is alive and well today. So these young white children that are your friends, and maybe you'll be friends for life, but not under the same circumstances. See, your friend will grow up to be a white senator, or a white congressperson, or a white banker, or a white real estate broker, developer. And you're going to need a favor from your friend for old time's sake. Then you got to go to power and maybe you can't deal effectively now, but this was your friend. I looked at Star the other night on CNN. Everybody gonna learn today. For see the foot of the master is not only kicking the little man. The foot of the master is crushing those who have traditionally been the tools of the master. Sister Star, she was so brilliant, so sweet, so factual, so clear. You could see in Larry King's face, he, he was troubled by her. Because Barbara Walters is an icon. And Star never thought that Barbara would do something like that. But Barbara never thought that Star would do something like that. Can you imagine? She loses weight. So the fat, plump, beautiful woman is now thin, beautiful, intelligent. But all of a sudden, the ratings are not what they are. Stop, put that to rest. Very intelligently, very brilliantly. But you are hurting because you're hoping. You're hurting because you're hoping not in God, but in your former slave master and his children to open the door to freedom for you. And that is not going to happen, not in this life. Now, look, look, family, this, this is family. Look, 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 dear family, look. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad gave us a lesson, and in that lesson he called the black man the cream. The original man. The Asiatic black man, the owner, the maker, the cream of the planet Earth. See, you don't ask for nothing, just a chance. Hey, you don't have to do nothing special for me. Just get out my way. And all of a sudden, cream rise to the top. See, they want homogenized black people.
you shake up the bottle, it still remain the same. With white folk on top. And you always serving them. That is not what God wants. Your time to serve your slave masters and their children is up. But you don't recognize that. So he's trying to show you. I don't want you. What you desire don't mean nothing to me. Hello guys. Tell me what you think about the video. Um, do you think that it's possible really for um, people to change? You know, um, there are some reasons I find it. The reason as to why it's so hard for um, palm colored people to change how they think because of um, certain reasons. And the first thing that I'm going to be talking about is um, historical conditioning, colonialism, slavery and segregation have deeply embedded racial superiority into Western society, normalizing and justifying an equal treatment of other races. Over centuries, this attitude have become, you know, um, there's so much historical conditioning and cultural um, inheritance because over the century, uh, colonialism and slavery were justified through ideas of, um, you know, racial hierarchy often suggesting that white people were more civilized or superior. This thinking was embedded into everything from religious teaching to scientific proofs created by biased scholars. These beliefs became deeply rooted that they began to shape not only personal attitudes, but also laws, policies, and institutions. By the time slavery was abolished and the civil rights movement gained ground, these ideas had already premated society on a cultural and institutional level. Many white people inherited these beliefs unconsciously through family values, education, and even media. Even if they weren't directly exposed to overtly racist ideologies, they often absorbed more subtle messages reinforcing white superiority, which now which now form part of the subconscious belief. This kind of conditioning is difficult to unravel because it feels normal or natural to these who have inherited it. The second thing why it's so hard for them to change is cultural enforcement and, me and media bias. Cultural enforcement, especially through media, education and um, religious narratives, continue to sadly or overly portray white experience and achievement as the default or superior. Textbooks in Western countries often highlighted European history, scientific advances, and art as a central to human progress, frequently excluding or minimizing non-European contributions. Movies, news, and literature can also reinforce these biases, often depicting non-white characters in a stereotypical or subordinate roles, which influences how individuals, which influences, you know, how individuals view other races. This reinforcement is so constant and subtle that many people internalize it without even realizing it. Recognizing requires confronting the idea that one's worldview has been incomplete or distorted, which can be uncomfortable and hard to accept. The third, thing, uh, the third thing that I'm going to be talking about is fear of loss and threat to status. For some white people, accepting equality can feel like a threat to privilege they have grown accustomed to. Privileges that are sometimes invisible to those who benefit from them. These include access to better housing, educational opportunities, employment and prospects and even fair treatment in the criminal justice system. Recognizing these advantages can be painful, and it often means acknowledging that much of one's success might not be solely due to their individual merit. Now, this perceived threat of losing status, power, or economic advantage creates a resistance to change. It's not necessarily a conscious feeling of malice, but rather a fear of unknown future where long-old 
privileges might disappear. This fear change is deeply psychological as humans are wired to protect their interest and in many cases resist situations that might put them in less favorable pos um, position. The fourth reason that I might be talking about is um, identity, comfort zone, and cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance is the mental discomfort experienced when somebody holds to conflict beliefs, values, or attitudes in the context of racism and privilege. Cognitive dissonance might arise when someone who sees themselves as fair-modded, ethical, or not racist is confronted with the reality that they benefit from or contribute to a system that discriminate against each other. Many people avoiding examin uh, examining these uncomfortable contradictions by rationalizing their behavior or blaming others, which helps reduce this dissonance. For example, minimizing racism by believing that racism is no longer a big problem or that it only exists in extreme cases, for example, eight groups. Um, individuals can maintain the belief that the system is fair and they're not complicit in any unfairness. The uh, other thing that I'm going to be talking about is selective exposure. That's still under cognitive dissonance. Many prefer to engage with information or people who challenge their news, staying within their comfort zone where their beliefs aren't questioned. This selective exposure helps them avoid cognitive dissonance, allowing them to maintain their current beliefs without discomfort. The fifth reason as to why it's so hard for um, black pe white people to change is systemic reinforcement and institutional racism. Beyond personal beliefs, institutional and systemic racism reinforces these issues often subtly by applauding, upholding policies and practices that disadvantage non-white groups. These systems create a, system, uh, a status quo that benefits certain groups while marginalizing others. For instance, in many countries, non-white communities face discrimination, policies in housing, employment, policing and education. Even when individuals with, um, even individual white people might not consciously endorse or contribute to these practices. I'm trying to think, why is it so hard? Like, <coughs> sorry, why is it just becoming so hard to um, just make these people change and see other people as equals? Why is it so hard for us to achieve this? Why is it so difficult? You might want to ask yourself that question. Now, putting it all together, the resistance to change then is a combination of cultural psychological and systemic forces. Historical conditioning creates a foundation. Uh, cultural, cultural reinforcement makes this belief feel natural, fear of loss, amplifies cognitive dissonance, deters critical self-examination, and systemic racism provides a sense of security within the current structure. Understanding these forces make it clear why change is slow, but, it's, but also highlights potential pathways for progress. One is education. Introducing broader and more inclusive narratives into educational systems to challenge one-sided histories. Two, exposure to, div uh, to diverse perspectives. Engaging with perspectives from other racial and cultural backgrounds to broaden understanding. Three, acknowledge privilege. Consciously addressing the cognitive dissonance involved in recognizing privileges and the systemic forces that maintain them. Four, Systemic reforms, working towards policies and practices that reduce racial inequality, making society more inclusive and fair. I think at this point, trying to put it together is just trying to um, look at a space where we can work together. For the longest time I know, this is not something that black people will want to hear. It's true because I understand. I really, really understand, right? now. There's so much education that it's still needed, for instance, to um, palm colored people, that they need to sit down and try, look and appreciate what other um, cultures are trying to do in regards to making things change, making things work for them, making them to recognize the problems, the challenges that other minority or marginalized groups 
uh, are going through. And um, I'm glad that, that Dr. Minister Lufer can try to touch on this perspective because it gives us things which are really happening. Look at the current society, looking at what are really happening around us. It really, really makes sense when it comes to that. I hope this video finds you well. As you always know, these are presented in stories. And until then, let's meet on my next video. Until then, peace, love, and harmony. Salute. And see you on my next video. Bye.